was thinking like before we started, Matt, you know, usually, you know, when you go for like family gatherings or you meet people and they ask you, Matt, what is it, what is it that you do? How do you usually describe the work that you do or what you do? I think about what the answer to that question is a lot because I still don't, <laughs> I've found it. I know, I know when we get close and we get close to understanding what it is that we do. It's one of those things I've, I've had long conversations with friends or philosophers and they get really annoyed with me because I, I, I say to them, it's actually beyond, it's beyond words in a sense, this thing yeah. that we aspire to achieve. And if you seek to describe it, it kind of evaporates, but you can feel it. And so I think probably if I were to distill what it is that Poppy and I think that we do, it, it's essentially about making rooms. That's fundamentally all we're really interested in. And then the scale of the room or the nature of the room, um, because it, it brings with it the implication of an awareness of others being in the room. So it's automatically, it takes us into the idea of, of what we're doing. I don't find it so interesting or compelling to talk about space and other things because it um, doesn't really imply any kind of human humanity. So yeah. we're interested in, in, the, in rooms and we're interested in the traditions of room making. I think that's fundamentally what drives our work and in what we do. Yeah, I love that, this idea of whether it's purpose or whether it's, you know, occupation. There's this element of humanity and I think that does come up you know, in your work. And I think that's why, you know, I've personally been drawn to the stuff that you've been doing as well. I'll tell you quickly about how I encountered your work before I ask you about, you know, how you got yourself into what you do. So about 14 months ago, I had my third child. And the night before he was born, I literally got woken up in the middle of the night and got this, this story from the Bible pop into my head about Abraham and about how Abraham looked to the stars. And God told Abraham that his children shall be like the, like the stars in the sky. Went for a walk outside my house and I went online. I searched the word stars in the sky. Um, I searched this idea of birth um, or herf. Um, and then a picture came up, which was your work actually. And it was the one with the arch, the mm -hmm. fireplace and that kind of beautiful stars. Mm -hmm. And um, I hadn't actually really kind of like focused on your work before until that picture. I, I wasn't, you know, even at the site. I'm all the way in Singapore and that's in mm -hmm. Tasmania, Tasmania, I believe, right? And that picture just, you know, hit me so deep. And, you know, even though not being there, I could imagine myself being at that spot. And there was just something so powerful and so archetypal about that. Your work really moved me that night as I was, you know, all the way in Singapore. And it encouraged mm -hmm. me being a father and, the minute I saw that, the first thing that came into my mind was generations, like generations mm. of people. I'll tell you something else, Ken. That image is, um, and, th and, this, and this one's for you, that image is a real image. That is a real photograph of the real night sky above the real light of the real interior of that, of that space. So it's, yeah. that's largely due to, frankly, the genius of Alan Gibson who took the shot. I stood behind him when he took it. But it was, important, it was important for me because I said to Adam when we went there um, that the image was a real manifestation of the intention behind the work. So that's a real image for you, Ken. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it definitely made a massive difference. I'm delighted by that story. I think it's marvellous. Yeah, it, it really, really made a massive difference for me. It just reminded me that, that everything that I was kind of building towards in my life and everything that was important to me, that it would, it would live on for generations. I think that comes back to like this idea that we're talking about today, which is the way that design or the work that we do, you know, for you, like you said, it's about making rooms. Um, for us, it's about telling stories. How this idea of process and purpose can, can interwine a lot sometimes. Mm -hmm. My question for you would be, when you see the words process and purpose, you know, what does that mean to you? Purpose is, is a stronger word than process yeah. because I think that the purpose is a grounding statement about the meaning of what we're seeking to, to do. Process is like, process I see as the kind of fundamental acts in practice. We talk a lot about what process is, but there's so much crap process <laughs> that... <laughs> But very rarely do you hear practitioners talk about purpose. You hear it, but you hear it from a particular strand of, of a mode of 
of practice. The architects that we most admire are driven by purpose in their work. It, it's not a typological question or a formal move or anything. Their work is underpinned by a searching quality that reveals the layers of possibility of the canon. We try our hardest to sit in that column, <laughs> but it is incredibly difficult. It's interesting that you talk about stories because I can totally imagine that and I, I see the parallel between what you do and our focus as well and that stories becoming so critical that people need people need stories and it's a way of communicating that is almost not bounded by time. There's a reason why when we go to Karnak we feel crushed still. Yes, I agree. You're talking about you know, typologies and archetypes in terms of shape and form. When you talked about not just about creating spaces, but making rooms, as you're saying that, you know, I'm thinking about you know, as designers and creators, it's more than just kind of creating, like, say, an archway, right? I've always loved um, the shape of an arch, not because it's a trend, but because of the story behind arches, you know, and the, the archetypal shape of an arch. When used properly, like, for example, with, with your project, it just conjures up this beautiful feeling of a cave. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore that shape as an archetype is embedded in our storytelling. It, it is embedded mm -hmm. inside us and it moves us emotionally in certain ways. There's a reason why architecture is a culture. It's probably for the very same reasons that many forms of practice rely on traditions of thinking. But architecture is it's such a deeply resonating ambition that those qualities of the way that walls resolve into one another or resolve into a ceiling or how, how an archway holds light differently or how an archway anticipates the fact that we might move our bodies differently to move through a threshold, those things are fundamental, but they're ancient. So you, you, can, be, you can be wondering about those things in, a, in the sense of your work and even in the sense of ours, but they belong to a tradition. And so we, we are always interested in, as it seems you are too, that the acknowledgement that these things are a continuity of a dialogue about being in places and modes of, modes of being and how um, certain interiors carry meaning for a lot longer than we live. <laughs> so yeah. I can't jettison the idea that, that our work has to outlive us. And even then, it still has to anticipate a human presence it has to it has to tell a story and i mean look how much look how much work doesn't do that that's the thing that i find so difficult um currently is just the kind of emptiness of so much work yeah the way that you think now like all these thoughts about you know carrying forward you know human human presence um you know, have you always thought this way like what what made you kind of say i want to be an architect and you know, this is the way that i want to create or tell me about how you started maybe Bobby and I, we were both fortunate to be taught by really some exceptional people and i remember the first year lecture um with bruce goodser who was a practitioner who had come down from queensland he gave a lecture about a chair and a cathedral I, I, I remember it so vividly. He started by saying, what is a chair? And then went to the next image and said, what is a door? What is a window? What is a room? What is a place to live in? What is a place to die in? And those questions just <laughs> filled me in a moment and something um, remarkable happened in my focus. There was nothing else I wanted to be. <laughs> and so from, from that point, um, I, I just, and I, and I also had other um, teachers who kind of inculcated that sense of responsibility to otherness and, um, and the anticipation of human being in the work. So that was a, my formative beginning. I love that story about how, you know, the questions really drove you. When I talk about telling stories and experiences, you know, I, I always thought I would be a filmmaker, actually. Mm. But what I, what I wanted to talk about now was, you know, the first time we encountered a room or a space, you know, it really moved, it moved me on the inside. I actually remember I actually visited the, uh, the Holocaust Museum in, in Jerusalem. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I think it was like, I think it was Moshe Safdie. And at this time, I wasn't sure exactly what my career was going to be. 
Um, and I remember venturing to the space and basically you know, it takes you through this you know, similar, very crushing kind of atmosphere in the beginning, you know, um, takes you to these rooms where you get to see just the, the enormous amount of, of life that was taken uh, during the Holocaust, but it, it finishes um, in this beautiful view. The, the narrowness opens up to this beautiful view of, of the city of Jerusalem. Mm. Um, I got to that point and I, I was just moved to tears. Because, you know, after being through all that and you see that city still there, um, it was just this idea of human um, endurance. Yeah. The promise of hope. It just really moved me. And I remember at that moment, I said to myself, I would love to be able to, you know, create something like this, where the convergence of emotion and purpose and experience comes together for a person. Yeah. yeah. You actually, was, was there any work or places or rooms that you had been to that moved you to that, you know, to that point? I went to Ronchamp, to Notre Dame du Haut, the Le Corbusier's chapel. That was one of my lecturers' favourite chapels. Wow. Uh, I actually stayed in Ronchamp with the wife of um, my lecturer had passed away a couple of years prior. And as a kind of pilgrimage, um, the two of us went to uh, Ronchamp together. Mm. And we stayed in Ronchamp and then we walked up the hill um, as the pilgrims do, and the sequencing, everything is so profoundly considered, um, and it is a really incredibly gritty building. Like the glass is just shoved in the render, and <laughs> and, and Le has just come and slapped on a kind of little prayer on the, on the stained glass. You know, it's so crude, but it's incredibly powerful. And when we went in, there was a, a, a group that followed us. We were, we were the only ones in the chapel. And then a group came in behind and they were a choir. And we didn't know. And they started singing. Oh. It, was oh. The most, it was the most profound encounter with an interior. And, and the other thing about that, the, the lecturer I was referring to was my history and theory lecturer. And he would show the work. Uh, as, a, as a, a kind of choreographed sequence of, of engagement and experience that could show how you approach the work and what, what happens when you're inside, explains the architectural idea. So it was all experience-driven. Every time I went to a project, I'd start to hear the narrative in, that he had kind of imbibed in us. And it was um, it's so powerful, isn't it, when, when buildings do that. Like it's such an amazing thing. I think also in those moments, you realise the extraordinary humility of the work. There's another order of interaction occurring that someone has conceived of this, of this moment and done it in such a sensitive way, almost as if to say, to show you something. It's always said that architecture can be so poetic in that sense that as you walk through the space, it's like reading a story or it's like reading a beautiful piece of poetry. And I feel like this conversation we're having now is establishing all these things that are important to you and the things that move you about space. And I hope, you know, for the guys who are listening in, you catch kind of like, it goes beyond the commerciality. It goes beyond the ego in that sense, even yeah. of what you're trying to do. We're getting a sense of what purpose really means to you. I guess, how do you take all this stuff that we're talking about and, and how have you rolled that into your, into your practice, into the way that you approach a brief or vision for where your practice heads? We do a lot of listening initially just to understand what the real aspiration is in the work. You know, there are reasons and there are real reasons. It, it helps to um, ground us in a kind of shared thinking about what, what it is that the work is aspiring to achieve. And we don't have a particular process. We're not that rigid in, in the way that we think about making work. Often we don't know what we're doing until the drawing appears. <laughs> Like we actually have no idea. And that can be disconcerting for our clients because they're kind of expecting us just to have the answers. But, but the, drawing, the drawings we're doing are always actually working through doubt. <laughs> mm. By the time we make the building, yeah. like we've already done our thing. The building can just be made. Like we could walk away and the building can be made. There is a moment where architecture occurs and I wonder if it has to do with the act of making a building, probably not. Whenever we teach, I always ask the room, who believes that architects make buildings? And 90% of the hands go up. We do not make buildings. We make representations of buildings. We do drawings. 
Architecture is a promise in the work. What we engage in can be so esoteric. You can't engage with clients um, <laughs> with, with, with all of that. No, you can't. They walk out the room. <laughs> oh, they, they would, and fair enough. So it does need to be carefully shaped. Like you said, the most beautiful work out there, even contemporary stuff, like you know, going to evoke St. Peter's project. The humility in that is you go there and you know that this stuff has been preconceived for a specific moment in time. You know, maybe they don't see all the angles, right? but it has the intention for it to be this a room, right? For, for things to converge. Yeah. And, and I, I've been big on convergence lately because I'm having children and stuff. The more aware you are of you know, how things are set up for the future. The thing that continues to blow my mind is, you know, for example, what you, what you felt when you were in that chapel. Maybe there wasn't an intention, you know, all those years ago for that moment, but everything was set in its place for that moment that you had when you were there. You know, there's no way that the architect could have known the time and place you'd be there, the, the circumstances of the visit, you know, the significance of the trip with, you know, lecturer's wife. But mm -hmm. yet, you know, everything was in place for, and for me, that's purpose. You know, everything was in place for that moment, you know, which, which then fuels you to move on forward in time. What we do, we really act as a kind of conduit for larger encounters with the world. So the more, the more humble the work, it, can, it, just, it kind of conveys um, us into those moments, like you with Jerusalem. And it, it is actually just a means of accessing a higher order of awareness of, of the circumstances that you're in. It can be done in very simple ways too, like some of the most beautiful work that's being made by really young practitioners, and they're making incredibly powerful places. When, when Stuart, um, quite apart from being a really generous practitioner, particularly to us when we were just starting out, he makes these buildings which are so exquisite in their domesticity and there's this kind of thinking behind them that is extraordinarily rigorous, um, <laughs> but they're sensationally um, powerful and memorable and meaningful. You know, the commercial column, you know, we have to be able to afford, afford the building or that it needs to be able to be built. It's like, absolutely, we know that. Now let's put that over here because the real question in the work is why we're engaged because you could go and get a building by anyone and it could be economical and it could be commercial, all of those things, understood. Yeah. But the spirit of the work, that's the real question and, and its relevance and its meaning and its power and... The spirit of the work is, is universal. Yeah. We have a whole generation of clients who do appreciate design. You know, they are mm -hmm. a generation that are you know, starting to be able to create their own projects and starting yeah. to commission designers. And you also have a generation of fantastic designers, not just coming of age, like old man Stuart, right? Who's, you know, he's starting to peak <laughs> in his career. <laughs> yeah, I love but you that. Have, but, but we have... <laughs> But we have a generation of young designers as well coming into the market and understanding you know, their voice. I think that um, I've been thinking about with my kids as well. You can hear them scream in the background, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Don't just build big, but build bigger than yourself. Yeah. And yeah, like you said, create for a higher purpose than just you know, getting a building built or getting a design done. Yeah. I feel like this has been a conversation that's really been a great reminder for me. So thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you very much. It was really great. Hopefully we'll see you sometime. I want to come and visit your project all the way in Tasmania. Yeah, you do that. That will be very interesting oh. for you.